Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, welcome to the Second Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn. Uh, in this session, uh, Larry Smith is uh, leading a conversation about how, if, when to automate business values, challenges, and trade-offs. Uh, it's a really interesting discussion. Uh, normally, we do this after 15 minutes, but I moved the discussion part, which runs 45 minutes, up to the front, and then you can listen to our chit-chat about masks and other human elements uh, leading up to that at the end of the show if you're interested. Uh, we had a very lively debate. Please join us uh, for the next ones. Uh, we have Jeff At Josh Atwell coming in next, and then we have uh, some great speakers, including Dave McCrory, Eric Wright, a uh, gentleman from Plumi, um, all, all coming in to entertain you and talk about uh, important topics for DevOps in a lunch and learn format. So please come by. Thanks. So yeah, so so um, one of the things uh, was that two weeks ago when we got together, we were coming up with topics and ironically, one of the conversations that I had just recently had at that time is um, having a conversation with a customer in which they made the comment of, you know, they were trying to get into automation. They're trying to look at all these different things, looking at pipelines and all the different portions of automation at scale. And one of the comments where they were like, I feel like it's too late. Um, and, and my question was, why? Um, they were like, well, because it seems like everybody else has been doing it for so long. We're just kind of late to the game. And my comment and what we talked about initially um, with Rob, and this is where everybody chime in. And I know specifically Josh and, and Keith and obviously Rob and anybody else that's on the phone that has any background in and scaled automation um, can chime in is that it's never too late. Um, now, if any, is the absolute best time that, that you could get started with this. And ironically, about an hour ago, I actually had another conversation around because of this pandemic, which I know we're not going to dive into that. That's one thing <laughs> we talked about, but I wanted to say that this is the paramount time um, to get involved with automation going forward. So I, I, I want to start with that. And then I'm just going to ask, uh, does anybody have anything they want to add to that? I have no agenda here. I'm just going to literally just rattle off stuff. Just kind of, let's go with it. I, yeah, well, I, I put in the chat and I think it's important to keep in mind and, and anybody who has that perspective should keep this in mind. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. Second best time is right now. Exactly. Perfect. <laughs> that's true. And that's, you know, I, I keep hearing this and it keeps getting, you know, more and more relevant um, in the conversation of number one, how do I start? When is the right time? Um, how do I train these folks? I mean, we could go on and on and on. And, you know, it's as Josh said, that's that's a perfect analogy. Now is the time as well as it was years ago. Um, the benefit of now is that a lot of processes that, you know, things we were doing five and six years ago are still relevant, but they're a lot more fine-tuned, right? Um, there's a lot more options uh, to, to go around um, with, with that level. And I, with that, I'm actually going to put Keith on the spot because I want to hear what Keith's take is on that. Larry, I I'm going, it was coming. I could. If I could, even though I'm in the same state, I would throw a rock at you. <laughs> I knew you were going to come here. Um, that's a great question, Larry. I face that with my clients, and it's a debate you and I have had on multiple channels. Um, <sighs> I, think the, I think it's a two-part. I think it's, the answer to that question depends on your perspective of where you are. Okay. Yep. Yep. If you're like most of us on this call, it's never too late to get started. Start now, do it now. Um, we're always taking it to the next level of evolution. We're looking at how to automate more, faster, better, cleaner. We're, we're going to the next level of creating tools that automate automation, right? Um, the, the, if you're on the consumer end, um, or the benefit or, or the business perspective specifically to me, it's more of how do I get there faster? Can I leapfrog and 
is there a tool I can buy? And I think one of the problems we have in this industry that I keep running into is, well, can I buy a tool for that? Right. And that, all the time. Yeah. And I think, you know, I always say this, you know, companies want to spend a million and a half for software or tool, but only want to spend $90,000 for the talent to run it. Um, and, and then they wonder why they're continuing to pay a million and a half for tools that sit on the shelf and don't work, right? Yep. I think we in the industry need to be better educators um, as to what automation can and cannot do. And I think to your point about those that are late to the game, we do need to be better at teaching them the basics of what it is, um, how to get started, how to get there, and what are the best practices? Don't get sloppy. Absolutely. You and I talk about it all the time. We've experienced where we have talented folks that say, oh, I can do a custom module for that. Why do I need to use, you know, like for instance, an Ansible module? Well, because you might not be there tomorrow. And so we're to figure out what the heck you did. Right? Exactly. So I think that's, yeah, we face all the time. I think it's, it depends. The answer is depends on where you are in your perspective. But I think the, the, the thing that we as an industry need to figure out, where is the right mix between the tool that someone gets off the shelf and the skill sets that many of us have perfected over the time to do this right. Yeah. And you, you, you brought up a good point. This is something, and, and Rob, I think I may have heard you speaking up. So I'll say this real quick. Yeah, go ahead. Um, is that, you know, this is a prime, prime time um, for those of us that have been doing this at large scale to, and I've done it. Um, I've kind of taken back, you know, kind of slowed down over the last two years um, to kind of let things catch up a bit. Um, but what it's done is, is uncovered for me um, that what is really, really, really important, I think, from some of us that have been doing it for a long time is coaching. And I know, Josh, you're a great person to, to call out as far as being an advocate as well. Um, you know, that, that you are always willing to share and always looking for these opportunities to share knowledge and stuff. And, you know, that's one of the things that um, you, I mean, we're all good at that. Right. But I'm just calling Josh out because that's kind of where, you know, when I first met Josh years ago, that was one of the things that was kind of his thing, right. Was giving back, giving back to the community. Um, but not only that coaching, um, you know, um, mentoring and things like that. One of those things is that we, we need to do, in my opinion, our due diligence to, to not sell another shiny tool or develop, no, no offense, rack in, um, but you know, they're doing awesome things. I do want to talk about that because that's a question for us, but yeah. Absolutely. And, and being able to coach these folks and take them that say, hey, it's too late. It's not too late. Um, but, well, that's, but what we can do for you is fast track those learning experiences for the last several years to get you in a place where you're ready to, to be able to consume an automation framework or whatever that looks like on that journey. So I'm going to stop there. So Larry, I want to, want to jump in with one thing um, okay. because I think Keith is right on, right? It's a, it's a significant gap on tool adoption versus, you know, reaching the potential and the promise that you bought the tool, you know, and the premise that you bought the tool. Um, and sometimes people have a, a shorter or a smaller outcome that they're looking for. But when looking for a coach or a partner to increase tooling adoption success, particularly around automation, um, I actively encourage people to reach out to their development side of the house yes. and say, hey, I have this tool. I have this need internally for like, IT operations or for, for this particular process, but uh, it also has the capacity to help with what you're doing we're actively trying to work closer together. Um, if, if you can help me get up to speed and, and learn how to effectively use this tool, I will prioritize your need and your project and getting that implemented as well. Um, Absolutely. I've Absolutely. used that strategy in the past and it's worked really well. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's a great point. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. I, I was just going to jump in. The other thing that I've seen both in, in my DevOps <laughs> side and also even in the, the, where I was before, which was an electronic legal management implementation mm -hmm. software company, was change management. So, you know, they spend, and it, to me, it's the same thing. They spend 60, 80, $90,000 on 
um, on this shiny new contract management solution or automation tool or anything else. And then there's nobody to actually shepherd it through and do the change management and get the user adoption. And I think that's also something that is, uh, is, is lacking and in, in, in goes back to exactly what you were saying about the coaching and the, um, and the shepherding. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Josh, you, what I was going to say, and I'll say it real quick, and what you said is spot on because the, I bring up the conversation with the, with the um, uh, customer that um, they were like, we were too late to the, we feel like we're too late to the game. But really what they were doing is it was from a networking perspective. And I think, Bob, you and I and, and um, talked about this two okay. weeks ago, is that it was a networking team that was actually, and this is a huge, huge customer. I mean, yeah. Um, they, they're from the networking side are doing the automation adoption in which their ops from a like systems and things like that are not doing automation. So they were actually taking it from a network perspective and doing exactly what Josh said is they want to make sure that they do it right so they can bleed over into the system side and all that, which I was blown away. I was like, well, that's interesting because generally it's the opposite way that I've seen personally. So, so what, what y'all are describing to me, and, and I, I understand the saying it's not a tools problem, it's, you know, it's the people on it, but I also feel like it is a tools problem also because we're not designing tools that have good reuse and good empathy and right, especially with automation, right? That somebody, I was at a SRE con, I think, or Lisa um, SRE con, and they were talking about the, it doesn't matter. It's one of the two. <laughs> they were talking about automation, which is robots have no empathy and when you spin up automation you know what what you know things will happen um, and I posted a link to this um, really good uh, software engineering radio um, about infrastructure as code practices right and infrastructure you your infrastructure is code especially once it's deployed you're changing stuff it's it, you're you're the risk is super high Absolutely. and so when your automation is running you know, you have to have a huge amount of ownership over what that, that automation is doing on your behalf. And it has no empathy. It doesn't understand if it's breaking something. It doesn't understand if it's tromping on a configuration. It's just running. And I, I feel like a lot of the tools that we've built for automation aren't, don't think about the operator experience from that perspective. Right. And so a lot, a lot of the coaching that we talk about and things like that are like, all right, how do we condition somebody to deal with automation? But then a lot of the tools we have have very little sort of like, oh, I pushed a button and right, it took down my you know web infrastructure. Exactly. <laughs> down. Um, and we don't we don't make it very safe. We we don't make it very portable. If I make a change to somebody else's automation then it could break their website. And so we end up with these completely forked um, copies of automation because nobody trusts anybody else to make changes to stuff that they have in production. Yep. And it, it feels so, like we literally take this, the, what should be human interactions and sharing and learning and, and best practices, and then just turn it all off because we don't want to deal with it. Um, and that's exactly the problem, Rob. Yes. Um, because when... When, when you look at how most people think to implement automation in a lot of these toolings is to, um, uh, to offset humans or to replace activities by humans versus augmenting the capacity of humans. Exactly. And, and that, is, that is the mistake that organizations make time and time again, right? You, what you're looking to do is make your staff more capable to do more faster and more um, effectively not make your staff redundant and unnecessary, right? Or, or, or short or, or cut the, the staffing as well. Yeah. Well, you mean the best analogy somebody gave me recent or I heard recently, and I'll try to remember the, the source was think more Iron Man suit, right? Yep. Um, versus, <laughs> versus Ultron. What you're doing is you're, you're trying to make, make the individual 
much more capable and effective versus um, making them unnecessary and redundant. Absolutely. And, you know, that's a good point. And, you know, I've had conversations as well as where you almost have to take the approach instead of saying that automation replaces people, it actually increases the number of people across the different areas to be effective, right? Yeah. And that's, you know, something that, that we've seen. And Keith, I'm surprised you haven't chimed in again, is, is something, you know, years ago, what, three, four, five years ago now, however long ago, is, is being able to, back to what Josh and Robert are talking about, is, you know, a lot of times automation is literally looked at from one pillar, right? It's, it's looked at from one focus, focus point. And well, the more people you, go ahead. I was going to jump on Josh and I said, so what I'm hearing from you guys is, is that we don't, the industry hasn't done, or businesses haven't done a good job of defining why they want to do automation, right? It sounds like it's a limited, to your point, Larry, the one pillar, it's a limited targeted solving of a problem without understanding the complexity of solving it holistically. Well, exactly. I think, I think the promise, the, the promise that's messaged to uh, leaders and, and IT folks in particular about the, the merits and, and capacity of automation um, exceeds practical reality of implementation. <laughs> um, yes. You know, just, just because you're able to demonstrate something um, uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be broadly applicable. And, and I think that's another shortcoming on, on tooling providers in that um, I, I think part of the reason that they're not intuitively user friendly is they aim too high to do too much and, and to, to promise more than, um, uh, more than what's absolutely necessary in order for an organization to be successful with that tool. And Josh, that's a good good point as well. And and real quick, and you guys can chime in on this if it's applicable, is one of the other conversations I've had recently is is around tooling. And I'm going to use two for example. I'm going to say one is Terraform and one is Ansible. And the question is, when is the right when do I say I'm all in with uh, Terraform, or when am I all in on Ansible, or when am I in where Terraform takes care of one portion? And then the config management piece comes in and leverage Ansible. The delineation on that message of what is the right tool and how it does it apply is a huge lack in the industry as well. The, uh, I, I think in the ultimate answer feels like, and I've had a, other conversations with this all over the place, is you're going to end up needing both. You're going to end up bouncing sure. between both, both tools. And then they, you know, they don't, that in itself creates problems from that usability experience. Right. Absolutely. Um, which then, um, you know, so if you're like, all right, this is the place where I run the Terraform plan. And then this is the place where I run the Ansible plan. <laughs> Ansible yeah, exactly. And if the data is not right between it or I mess something up and everything goes to hell and then neither of them are actually the, imp this is what drives me nuts. And I actually thought that the podcast that I was sharing did a pretty good job in doing this. Once you build the infrastructure, the infrastructure is the infrastructure. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it doesn't exactly. matter what's in the Terraform plan or your Ansible inventory. Um, you know, if, if you know, it's, it, that's the thing that makes this really, really hard is that your, your script doesn't mean anything if it doesn't match the source of truth. The, actual, if the source of truth is meaningless. The infrastructure is the source of truth. Exactly. So I, I, had, this, I had this challenge that I put out at the PowerShell Summit God, probably like four or five years ago when we're talking about desired state configurator. Right, you know their yep. mm -hmm. um, their their answer to all these tools that we're talking about. That's and DSC, the, right, Josh? DSC, yep. Okay. Um, and and the challenge and the question I had asked at the time was is um, who watches the Watchman, right? Uh, yeah. So you you go out and you develop all these configurations and all the you know these state configurations regardless of the tool that you're using, um, and if you're implementing across multiple environments implementing across multiple layers in your, in your stack. Um, how do you maintain reconciliation of what's being managed by code and by desired state configurations and what's not? Um, it's, it's not always, it was, it, at the time, it definitely wasn't a clean line. 
and I don't feel like it's improved all that much. I know GitHub helps, but um, it, it just helps know what changed versus where things are being applied. Kind of to your point earlier, Rob. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been trying to figure that I, I ended up in a huge Twitter battle on infrastructure as code and I did a talk about about it. Um, I ended up read like an article and then a talk about it. Uh, yeah, and I gave it last week. Uh, yeah, again. It was good too, by the way. Thank you. Appreciate that. That was a fun <laughs> one. Um, and it's nice because I can I, I, I can just, um, you know, unreservedly say this is why we did digital rebar like we did um, and, and hold it up as an example. It's not a promo. It's just a like lessons learned. Um, but um, yeah, I, I feel like infrastructure as code has this dilemma where desired state is super important, but so is like source of truth and documentation in it. Yes. And then also, you know, this sort of continuously integrated keeping things going perspective. And I, I don't, yeah. the tools we're using, you know, this has been my frustration, you know, when we look at Terraform, um, you know, it's not designed as a, it, it sort of is designed as a desire, desired state engine, but it's really designed as a client tool, just like Ansible is. Ansible yeah. is not designed to hold state. It was designed to assert state. Uh, That's true. Um, yeah, one thing I'd like to add too, and um, it's, it's just something that that I talk about, and, and again, Keith, you, we've talked about this numerous times, that one of the things that's very important, I think that a lot of people um, maybe not think about, um, but one of the ways I'll just say, the ways that I approach automation is I keep tools agnostic. I think about the tooling mm -hmm. after the fact. I get basically focused on, let's call it a data model. That data model is, it could be whatever. You could be wherever you want that to be. Let's just say it's YAML, because I know everybody loves YAML. Um, but it could be JSON, whatever, right? <laughs> but your data model is agnostic to the tooling, and that data model becomes, let's not call it the source of truth, but in all reality, it could become the source of truth. But that data model is basically what defines what the infrastructure or applications or whatever it needs. And then you come in and say, okay, I need to do this and I'm going to choose this tool. The data model stays the same in which the tooling actually adapts to the data model. Therefore, if I change that tool, all I need to do is adapt that tool. So think of translations and things yeah. like that. Hmm. I, I think the bigger challenge there, Larry, though, is less in the in the data model and, and your your relationships between I mean with context to why people may have difficulty adopting or feel like they have difficulty adopting. The bigger problem I've run into has been more along um poorly documented and understood processes that yes. are wanting to be automated. Because if you want to be agnostic about um, which tool you use or be be um, able to flexibly change from one tool to the next. It's not critically difficult if you have a very clear understood process for whatever it is that you're wanting to, I mean, it's time consuming, yes, but um, it, it doesn't have to be horrifically painful uh, if you understand your process. Exactly. And, you know, that's a good point, Josh. And, and, you know, some of the conversations I've had around that too is, you know, saying focused, you know, like working with, let's say we're, we're working on an automation project or, or a, 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 an approach you're going to take from an automation perspective. And, you know, maybe we come in and we talk about data model and things like that, we'll outline that thing and get it in a clear defined format in which you're trying to use for your automation, your documentation, you can generate um, graphing, you can implement security, you can tap all these things into that model. And the question also becomes, why are we spending so much time on this model when we could be automating things? And your point that, <laughs> that I caught on to is exactly where I'm going with that is because the planning up front defines the process in which you're going to attack the problem, right? Thank you. Thank you. Ah, I, so Thank so you. actually, I, I would love to get feedback on this because we're, th oh, there's a, a story and then um, I'm looking for how to define this. The, the, I'm going to tell it a little out of order. Because we've been using this phrase called automation chaining or yep. having an unbroken automation chain. And what you're describing to me when you describe the process, you're 
you're saying, all right, it's not a single tool. Like the stuff we deal with at, on the bare metal side is there is no single API. It's not like a cloud. It's like, uh, I need this API to take this action and then I have to jump over to a different API, yep. a different action, then come back to something else. And um, so, right, if there's no, there's no smooth, like just keep hitting the API with Terraform. It's, it's not, you know, we, we don't have those luxuries. Exactly. Um, and we right. had this experience where we went into a, a customer account who just needed like, oh, I just need you to install an operating system and then, you know, turn it over to Puppet to finish or Ansible Tower to finish. Yep. Uh, and by the time we got to the point where Ansible Tower could do the work, we had to interface with 10 different systems <laughs> in their data yep. center, you know, like Remedy and Active Directory and, and yep. DNS and their IPAM. And it's like, and every and the, the, the thing that, that jumps out to me is they didn't know. When we sat down to start the process, they were like, well, just lay down the operating system and turn it on and then, you know, attach a, a the SSH keys and go. And, you know, it was like an archaeological dig, figuring out all the chains and all the yep. steps in this automation chain. Yep. Yeah, I think they articulated well in the Phoenix project. Uh, mm -hmm. when they were talking about wanting to make change and misunderstanding dependencies and, and where that flow of work. Um, you know, I, for, God, for the longest time, I don't actually want to put a number of years on it, um, have, have stated emphatically that if you, you can't automate it, if you can't whiteboard it. That's right. Um, <laughs> That's right. I mean, it's, that, it's, it's, it's basic. It's a as whole if then thing, right? It's a whole d decision tree. Yeah, but so, I mean, it's it's an understanding of like where you start and where you're wanting to end. Because yep. to Rob's point, right? It's like, yeah, just get the operating system online. It's like, oh <laughs> gosh, there's so much that goes into that. And to add to that is is the thought of trying to convey, and this is another struggle, right? Is the whole mentality of, yeah, I'm going to automate it, but I'm only going to do it one time. No, 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 no. Let's, uh, let's approach this from the angle of an iterative process that is always in a pipeline, always running. You always get that churn and, and uncover anything along the way, but being able to visualize what it looks like in the beginning and what it looks like in the end and how not to break things when it runs the next X number of times. Yeah. That's a huge, huge challenge. And I think that's where the coaching also comes into play is, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to get your head around that piece, right? I, well, I'm, I'm laughing. I'm laughing at the old developer joke, right? It compiled. I'm done. Exactly. Think, right. If you, if you run automation and it works the one time, it is not automation. That is, that is. A, no, <laughs> that's a hit it and quit it, baby. I'm out. So, yeah. And, and so the interesting thing about this though, is going back to Rob's point earlier about the lack of empathy. Um, if, if you are not, implementing automation with the emphasis on supplementing and augmenting the capacity of your team, then it's very easy for you to let your automation efforts become your future technical debt. Yes, absolutely. Because your, your environment's going to change. And when you change the environment, inevitably it's going to break some portion of absolutely. automation that you've implemented at some point. Absolutely. So Josh, how do you, how do you, Josh and Rob, how do you guys speak to stakeholders, decision makers in explaining the automation journey, right? So how do you get them to understand, oh, it's not just come in and do some code and it works. There is a planning, there is a design, mm -hmm. there's a intent. How does that work? Um, so the, the way that I generally start uh, is to, politely do a little punch in the mouth of uh, <laughs> well there's some empathy hold on yeah really <laughs> hold on hear me out hear me out um i i i pose the scenario of um if you as an individual or if you have individuals in your organization who are critical in or who are uh, are, are critical in a business process that has the potential to be automated. They, they have effectively become the bottleneck of that process and therefore become a limiting uh, limitation to the capacity of the organization to succeed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by, by, and by implementing appropriate automation, um, not only do you empower 
um, those people to be more effective and, and, and to um, you know, apply value into other processes, um, but they no longer become that anchor on the ship of progress um, to the point about turning up an operating system. Remember when it used to take months to get a system up and then it oh, took yeah. weeks and then it took hours and now it can be done in minutes or depending on what you're doing in seconds. Uh, it used to be a person, and this is the analogy I use, it used to be a person was a bottleneck in that process. That process has since been automated. And guess what? We still have the people. <laughs> They're yep. just doing other valuable things. But yep. how do you get how do you get buy-in from smaller enterprises to get that in place? And I that's the certainly mm -hmm. the challenge I've always been up against. Um, not only at at Legal Suite where I I, I was until recently because I was the bottleneck. I'll tell you right now. Mm -hmm. On my on my I did a soft two type two um, from zero to sixty, and I was listed in multiple places as a point of failure. Because oh, no. if, yeah, because if anything yep. happened to me, security was gone. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, I was I was an absolute risk to the company. If anything happened to me, if I got hit by a bus, they were screwed. And I, I said it a hundred million times, but I couldn't get the buy-in for them to help me either do automation for certain specific things like deployments of new clients, like backups um like just even basics and that was i think it's 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 a hard pill to swallow for some sort of medium one to five million dollar companies mm -hmm. a year right like i i that's at least where where the, the problem i've run up against in the last four or five years and you know i'll i'll add to this and i feel like josh is getting ready to jump in again too is that in those scenarios in the past you know I've, however many years i've been doing this um, is, is that's when I will let things break, let things break or, or let's just take it a step further, purposely break something to uncover a failure or lack of, um, additional capacity from an, from an engineer perspective. Mm -hmm. and, I, I and, very much caution on that last one, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> chaos yeah, I, exactly. I, chaos <laughs> engineering. Yeah, as the person who handles the emergencies, I caution on that one too. Hmm. I have done it though, I'm not gonna lie. Oh yeah, I've um, done it in major, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so, I mean, me going on sick leave and needing emergency surgery was exactly that. You know, you it, was, it yeah. was just, it was just, I mean, I didn't do that on purpose, but you know, I mean, I, I, mean, I, I knew it would happen and, and what happened was, you know, it was, the moral of the story was Sherry worked from a hospital bed for, for six weeks, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. which is just it's not it's not fair to anybody it's nope. not fair to anybody and it's not fair to the organization and it's not fair to the clients nope. and you know at the bottom at the end of the day none of us are going to have jobs if we have no clients that's right fair um so to to your original inquiry there um i tend to take an iterative iterative approach um i uh, i let people know automation is you you get out what you put in Right. Tools, tools will help accelerate that depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but the biggest challenge I run into isn't or hasn't been support from management. It's been resistance from you know, people on the ground doing the work. Uh, and it's you know, fear and trepidation and you know, fear of those first three steps. And the, the plan that I put together and I've seen work a few times successfully, and this is just based on people reporting back to me knowing that it worked successfully, was most organizations have that one or two people or that small handful of people who are um, adept. You know, they, they know how to write a little bit of code and they know how to, to implement these tools. And what I helped one organization do was you want to raise the water level of um, uh, literacy for using these tools. And the way that they set it up was is after your week of on call, your following week, you are on automation duty. And <laughs> nice. Yep. Awesome. And so it's, it's a nice chill. Like you, you don't respond to calls unless it's like a you know, major, major, major thing. You don't respond to school. You're not doing break fix work. You're not, you're not doing maintenance work. You're on automation duty. 
and the the lead people who have the most skill in automation define the define the work in progress and the backlog and they they serve as product product managers project managers how you want to look at it um and and keep people active right most of the time they're doing automation full-time anyway except for when they're on call and what ends up happening this is human human reaction what ends up happening is everybody gets their literacy up a little bit some people say, I hate this crap. I don't want to do this. This is not what I want to do IT. Yeah. Um, and they, what will happen is, is, and you don't have to manage this, it'll happen by itself. They will start swapping with other people. Hmm. And they will say, hey, uh, Rob, I know you like doing this automation stuff. Will you switch with me? Will you take my week of automation? Like, I just, I just want to do maintenance and break fix. And I just, I just want to do what I got hired on to do. Um, before long, you'll find that about a third of your organization is really keen to understand and, and implement this technology and they'll self-select. <laughs> that's, that's actually very, very creative, Josh. That's, that's a great way to find the passionate folks um, in, in what, the, uh, what the goal is, right? Um, that's, that's, that's an awesome tactic for sure. It's, it's funny. I, I actually thought that you were driving towards an SRE type of idea where you're saying, look, you're going to spend a week, you know, dealing with the fires. And then the next week, you're going to, you're going to know where the fires are that you can then put out. And so it's sort of a nice, let's pay down some technical debt while you <laughs> just still fresh in your mind. Yeah, that's, and, and the, those, those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. Uh, what, what I've found is that there's um, even with whatever the latest outage was, there is such a backlog of just higher priority toil to address that, you know, once you get that done, it's very easy to transition exactly into that kind of model to where you're immediately addressing, you know, not even waiting till next week, but you start to be able to immediately address um, those scenarios. So, so you said the word toil, which interestingly we hadn't mentioned yet. Um, and to me, you know, my answer for the, the original the original question on this, or the latest question on this, is a little bit back to, to toil. And some of it's, you know, in the tools from our from our our approach, right? We want to be able to say if you're if you're working with automation, you know, you want a community of people who you can share with, who you can say, hey, I want to improve this. And then it doesn't have to be your solo job. Right, that, that to uh, to me, the rec end, I'll say us for rec end. You know, if we can get people to reuse automation, then then everybody's better, and then like actually compare and contrast and and help each other or just improve operations. Um, like I was always frustrated with Ansible Galaxy because it was like, oh yeah, there's a ton of people with with forks, but nobody ever came back and said, this is really good, or I fixed it over here, I can take that fix. Um, and so that always bothered me for that. And, and, you know, I've always wanted to try and fix it. The, the specific things we do are not so much um, on the, the person team directly, like not, not handholding individuals, but we do work really hard on eliminating black, um, black box operations which we we find to be really destructive to people when something when magic happens and you can't be like i can't figure out what your magic is um those things are really 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 hard on people and really bad in emergencies and then the other the other thing we do and this always gets a fight at first is that we don't put retries in um in anything pretty much anything we do unless we know there's a real need for a retry which means yep. there's a broken system on the other side we don't if yep. something breaks we stop yep um which which almost always ends up with a fight every time we walk into a new situation and they're like but just retry it it'll fix itself we're like no nope. <laughs> no we're, no retries <laughs> fix the underlying problem mm -hmm. so that the thing works the first time through if it's stopping, that means there's something broken. Do not proceed forward if there's something broken. Hey, Keith, that sounds familiar, right? You know, eight hours into a 10, 12 hour pipeline and something breaks. Oh, we'll just retry. Nope, tear it down, start over. Figure it out. That's, I, 
it's been amazing to me. We spent a lot of time over the last year just building checks, tests, and fail safes so that you know we do as much as possible before you even run a line of, of configuration to check every possible you know, circumstance and when you finish when you finish it, you check every pot. That's the thing, people don't understand how much of, of, of good automation is actually validation testing that your yeah. automation is ready, mm. it's safe to run and then did what it was supposed to do. So Rob, from the black box standpoint, uh, yeah. uh, I think it's always important and, and I always highlight this when when talking to people about automation, particularly when giving a demo. Um, we don't as, as great as the automation is, people do not inherently trust that it did what it was supposed to do. And we know this for a fact because it's evidenced in that anytime anyone does an automation demo at an event, on stage, whatever, they always go back to the graphical user interface to prove that it did what it did. And, <laughs> and that is so self-defeating because not only have you just fell back into people's comfort level, you, you, you've shown them that, well, you do automation and then you check the GUI to see if, if it worked. Whereas you want to teach them to learn to use the same tool to do the validation. Yes. Right. And, and so there's a, there's a psychological safety that's missing there. And it's really just, in my opinion, mostly just ignorance, knowing that the tool doesn't just do automation. It also should do the validation and verification. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We we are closing in quickly on our uh, end of end of hour for this week. Uh, awesome. Final comments, questions, suggestions. Let's ask the ones that haven't spoke up yet. If there are any, I don't know. Don't yeah, be well, scared. I'll, I'll chip something in because I haven't said anything yet. Um, <laughs> Might turn this into a longer discussion, though, which is, you know, from <laughs> I think the, the enterprise tech leaders' perspective, um, there's a lot of budget challenges in some approaches to automation. Mm. So, like, if you assume a fixed budget, which many of them are, uh, you're left with very little flexibility to find budget to buy new tools. Um, and so that puts you in a position where you really have to figure out how do you get a hold of a tool that's a, a one-time kind of a fixed cost instead of a tool where the cost scales as you use more of it? Because you can't find the money to do that. Um, and so, you know, yeah. approaches like that's Ansible or Terraform or that kind of thing tend to work out pretty well from that angle because you kind of pay for a one-time thing and then you use more and more of it, but you don't have to pay more. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that's, that's usually one of those ROI, uh, yeah. ROI arguments. It's like, how, how quickly do you get that return? I, I find more and more that if you, if you can't deliver uh, an equal return within a fiscal year, then it's more of a challenge. Yep, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's even more so right now with the uh, things that I guess we're not supposed to mention on this call, but a lot of people are looking for <laughs> in-year fiscal returns. Yep. The uh, elephant, unexpected challenges. The elephant. <laughs> and, uh, I will say one of, the, one of the ways I've gotten around that is um, more, is the cost of what's going to happen when um, the shit hits the fan to, to be blunt, yep. you know, and sure, you know, and I agree also, especially having worked in sort of medium sized enterprises that, um, you know, the cost, especially dealing with what we do here in North America versus what Europe does. And that's been my challenge for the last five years um, because our head office is in, in, in France, but um and the differences there and what the, the tools they're using versus the tools we're using. The, the cost of the way I always got around it was showing what we would lose and what it would cost us to get out of the, the hole we've now dug ourselves into. And that's always sort of opened mm -hmm. the eyes. And maybe that's, it also depends if the company's risk averse or not, right? True. That's, that's a it's crucial interesting right way to see it. Yeah, of the, the 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 whole and it may the whole can't be so scary that you give up. It has to be it has to be a starting point, right? Yeah, well, and that's where the cheerleader comes in of saying, you know, we can fix this, but this is, you know, and, it, and again, it comes with change management. It comes with a plan. It comes with, 
you know, and, and, and I don't, I think Rob's already heard me say this. I don't need to be the smartest person in the room. I need to know who the smartest people are, go get them and give them the tools they need to, to go and do this so that we don't need to be in that situation. And that's, how I've, you know, definitely managed it along with budgets and things like that to be able to, to push this kind of stuff forward. Well said. And that might be the perfect place to wrap it. That's perfect. Excellent. Everybody, thank you. This was a lively conversation, which makes my day. Um, come back next week. And uh, Josh, we're going to let you have the hot seat in the microphone. So, all right. I'm very you. nervous. <laughs> I'm so proud. All right. Uh, Larry, thank you. Appreciate you. Yeah, thank you guys. Organizing the discussion. See you all next week. All right. See you guys. Hello, everybody. Sorry if I made you wait in the panelist area. No worries, man. I was um, having a problem finding my uh, uh, link. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I was just about to post a new one. Uh, hold on. <laughs> Drop that into Twitter. I'll look at all these. But the way I'm the in order to get the registrations to work for this, um, yeah. I I made it a, a webinar, and then I'm just promoting everybody to be a panelist. Uh, through the process. So when people show up, they just get bumped into being a panelist. So everybody can talk. And then everybody except Josh Atwell. Don't don't take don't <laughs> <pass me. laughs> he'll get his time when the sunlight. <laughs> that is a completely reasonable perspective of <laughs> uh, I haven't talked to Josh in a long time. It has been a long time. Yeah man. The uh well the 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 goal here is 15 minutes of, of social and catch up. Um, we are recording it, so don't say anything you don't want shared, but I am post-processing um, the, the video. I guess it ends up really being audio. No, it'll be video once, once y'all, if y'all have signed to share with Larry. And then, um, but I move the sharing part to the front so people aren't fast forwarding through 15 minutes of, of chatter and welcome. That's exactly organized. <laughs> um, but I, you know, the first the first couple minutes are check in, so you have say say hi and, and let people talk. Cool, cool. And then Larry, you get you get the mic today to to give us some some education. Yeah, and I I have absolutely I have no slides as we talked about last week and two weeks ago. All uh, right. So we are just gonna talk. Uh, that sounds great to me. Happy for Larry, that. I'm just, I'm just happy. I don't have... Go ahead, Keith. Sorry. No, I was going to say, Larry, isn't that the only way you operate? That's the only way. So just so everybody doesn't know, I've known Keith for years and we used to work together. So uh, here we are. <laughs> yeah. So, so does that mean you paid him to be here? I shared it with him. <laughs> yeah, he bribed me. <laughs> awesome. Sorry, I couldn't pass that one up. I apologize. You know, in old school, it would be stickers or t-shirts. I've been cutting up my uh, conference t-shirts for masks and stuff. Trying to... Yeah, I've had a couple of those donated to that cause. <laughs> and my wife's making some. Um, she hasn't done them out of t-shirts, so that's a good thing. But somebody did ask um, some friends of the family. Uh, she was making some for them. She sent them pictures. And they, they questioned whether they were my underwear or not. So... <laughs> <laughs> and how many times they had been worn <laughs> no, it's not it doesn't matter how many they've been worn it's how many times they've been washed exactly there you go and you and you want you want that number to be plus one of the worn <laughs> there you go n plus one right <laughs> oh <That's> awesome <laughs> you could definitely i definitely have some fun i like some of the patterns i've seen they've, they've been pretty good yeah my, my wife's made about 120 so far nice She's been busy yeah wow yeah, she uses the the t-shirt, the jersey material on the mouth side, um, and then she applies a filter and then an external um, pattern on the on the outside. Makes sense. Very cool. That's what the pattern I'm using. You can put a filter in it, and so mm -hmm. start cutting out coffee filters or something. To I've heard that's that's a good. The the best that we've seen or done is getting the 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 HVAC filters that you get for, you know, your 
internal air supplies, um, taking those and you can cut them up. So we're, we're getting the uh, HEPA filter level 1500 or 1900, I don't remember what it was. But the, I guess the N95 level filter filtration or something like that. That's a good idea, nice big sheet of that too. Yeah, and it's 20 bucks and I think she can make like 40 oh, uh, wow. filters mask yeah, filters out of them. 50 cents a HEP for a HEPA quality filter. Yeah, it, it's it's working really, really, and they're washable. I mean, you don't oh. throw them in the washing machine, but like you can rinse them in the sink. Okay, I'd assume that part would be disposable. That's what I was gonna do with the, I wash the mask and then uh, mm -hmm. put the paper filter. I was gonna do the coffee filters in and out. But... So what I'm also hearing is Josh is going to be marketing underwear with HEPA filters. Well, they already have them with charcoal <laughs> filters. <laughs> not, not that I own any, but I'm aware of them. <laughs> That'd be awesome. Oh, my goodness. It's, yeah, that could be a you know, benefit. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's awesome or not. Like I said, I haven't, I haven't handled, but, you know, there, there's, a market. there's a market there. Let's just say that. Yeah, if we've thought it, somebody needs it, right? <laughs> exactly. Considering the topic you have queued up for next week, asbestos underwear is actually an appropriate uh, uh, coup de Yeah. Um, you know what? I might have to find a way to incorporate that. <laughs> underwear as a service. <laughs> uh, meaning, yeah, maintaining cool in the face of an outage is a hard skill. Very hard skill. <laughs> and a very undervalued skill for those who are very good at it. <laughs> That's awesome. Not not rising to the occasion. So I was I was trying to think. I'm I've been on this Twitter thread. I was I was going to switch this into ops a little bit, and I'm interested in people's uh, commentary on some of this. Um, uh, what's the it's a, it, it's a multi-cloud hybrid cloud tech debt thread. I'm trying to figure out where it started because it's it morphed like crazy. Mark Teeley, of course, was the original author, but let's see. While you're looking for that, um, yeah. I uh, don't know any of you other than Rob. Um, oh, but, you have a yeah. Oh, well, that's okay. It's just me. Everyone else seems to know each other. <laughs> um, I uh, uh, thought I was saying something brilliant during um, the comment about uh, undervalue uh, emergency people, and that's exactly what I am. Is uh, that's my that's my superpower, as I like to call it, is the calm in a crisis, managing emergencies, and um, in ops and things like that. Yeah, I thought awesome. you were going a different angle of my superpower of being grossly undervalued. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am that obviously considering I'm currently unemployed. So we oh, could no. say that that Ooh. is one in the same. Sorry, so, my joke just fell no, a lot flatter no. than I wanted it yeah. <laughs> Josh, go back up a video real quick. All right, I'm glad. <laughs> no, 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 it's totally, it's, it's totally fine. Rob was kind enough uh, to uh, actually accept to, to speak to me a couple weeks ago and, uh, and then introduced me to uh, Eric Wright, who I had a great conversation with um, uh, last week. So, and we discovered that we have the same approach to working, which was nice because... I've never met anyone else who had that sort of, you know, we'll get everything done, but it might be at like 11.59 p.m. kind of approach. Yep. But it'll get done, and it'll get done way better than if I had started it way earlier. Yep. Um, so, yeah, and I unfortunately have been uh, been on the hunt for uh, either a contract or a position for a while, so Rob mm -hmm. was kind enough to... Uh, Give me half hour of his time so I could cry on his shoulder a bit. <laughs> I was impressed with a nice conversation. So I'm glad so, you did. Uh, Sherry, I think it's interesting because I'm, I'm guilty of working effectively the same way, but I anticipate looking for a job is probably not a task that you want to work in the same manner. <laughs> no, no, no. And I've like, been looking for a while and I got close and, you know, stupid hindsight is twenty twenty, right? I had an offer in my 
<clears throat> old company asked me to stay and said all the right things and I accepted to stay and then they they pulled a they pulled the offer three weeks after I had said yes to it. Okay. Hey. What's up with that? On uh, my my lovely cleaning lady is my wife. Not really a cleaning lady. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to be careful with that. Just say it. Yeah, no, no. I'm, she, she's a she's a multi talented person. She's also served as an Uber driver. <laughs> That's awesome. Since I don't have a car. <laughs> so she's just taking people on her back. Is that it? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> so she 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 used to drop me off at physical therapy before all this happened, oh, and okay. um, when she would drop me off, and and I don't have a car. Um, because I like saving the money for vacation um, and I work from home. So I didn't, I was like, I don't yep. need one. Um, but she would drop me off and I'd be a little bit late and, you know, physical therapist would be like, everything okay? I'm like, yeah, my Uber driver is really gorgeous though. So I didn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You are highly incented to get five star reviews. Yeah. From that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same, same with the cleaning and, and the, and the tutoring and, and all the other myriad of wonderful things that she does. Um, I also have a guest attending with me today. Oh, Does, doesn't look thrilled. <laughs> well, um, she doesn't look thrilled because, hi Molly. She's, oh, she's interested now. <laughs> <laughs> she's a, a very badly shaved Portuguese water dog. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> it's, it's been, uh, it's, it's, I decided to borrow some clippers from a neighbor yesterday. And <laughs> my oh, groomer okay. has to, any groomer in the entire North American region is nothing to worry about me taking clients from them. Let's say that. So, um, but she, I'll keep myself on mute because she she likes to to bark and chat with people. So. That's awesome. I've got pictures of my own poor shaving shaving attempts. Hold on, let's see if I can figure out how to do. Which I, never, I, sent, I sent a picture to my breeder and she was like, "That's great," and I'm like, "No, no, no, you don't understand. That's not." <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's, oh, that's, that's much awesome. better than. <laughs> okay, that's funny. That's, that's, that's fantastic. My, 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 my child took the pile of hair and added to eyes, which is awesome. That's, that is awesome. Then, that is awesome. But like his ears are like it's it's he's super embarrassed. It's horrible. Anyway, but the the dog is super embarrassed. The dog should be embarrassed. I. <laughs> I oh, okay. I didn't know that embarrassment was a capacity of. Canines. <laughs> I just, I just, I took the guards off the trimmers and made it as short as possible. Right, Sherry, probably. Similar yeah, that's what. That's what. I, I've never used a set of trimmers before. I literally. I mean, I hate this. This is usually how I do everything in life. I watched a YouTube video first and decided, okay, this is what I have to do. Um, and, and then uh, I've left her her head long, but she was so matted and she kept sort of gnawing at herself. So I just felt so guilty. Um, well, that remind, have you guys, speaking of watching YouTube videos and that, taking care of your dogs, one of the struggles we have is trimming the nails. Has anybody seen the videos of the folks putting the peanut butter on their forehead? Oh, yeah. Isn't that crazy? No, what a great idea. <laughs> well, I don't know about anybody else. I know this is recorded, but it is what it is. If I go walking by with a dog, with a dog and some peanut butter, it's going to be a different conversation in my house. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, let me let me see if I can find a link for you. Uh, <laughs> it's awesome. Dog peanut butter head, yeah. That's fantastic. It's. Uh, it's yeah. yeah, that was pretty. That showed up on my Twitter feed. Uh, pretty, pretty aggressively. Oh, Donny. And with that, Donnie Burkholz in the house. Uh, we, it's, it's 15 after. Um, I was gonna suggest that we, we put Larry on the spot and let him talk for a little sure. while. Sounds like, like he's gonna be happy for it to be conversational, but absolutely the floor. And uh, then we can hang out after, after work too. Sounds good, I'm gonna go off video because I know we talked on not doing video. Yeah. Go, the goal is not, if you're eating lunch, we don't, we don't need to see it. So, <laughs> so audio only, only. This picture is way better than the real life version anyways at this point. 